Welcome to our family history. This is our crazy family. Here are Henry and Inga who are head of the family. Here are the Pattinsons. Here are the Hollises. Here are the Rabies. And we're going to show you how our family came to be. Our family history begins with the Rose, whose daughter Kitty married Hector. John Henry Bannister Rowe was born on the 17th of August in 1802 at Blandford, Dorset, to parents of William and Elizabeth Rowe. John Henry Bannister Rowe married Mary Ann Allies at Bristol in September 1828. Their son, Henry Dalton Rowe, was born in 1833 in Blandford Forum, Dorset. Henry Dalton Rowe, now a master mariner in the merchant service, aged 32, married Cecilia Sophia Scott, aged 19 in Port Louis, Mauritius. Henry Dalton Rowe and Cecilia had May, Maud, Sissy, a son, and Henry Chatham Rowe, born on the 7th of July in 1868 in Blandford Forum, Dorset. Henry was educated at Christ's Hospital School and was later a very handsome and hard-working Manners and Morton Scholarship student at Corpus Christi College in Cambridge, where he received his BA in 1890. In 1891 census, Henry Chatham Rowe, described as a theology BA, was aged 22 and described as a visitor, perhaps a lodger, at the house of Mary James, 70 Victoria Street, Exeter. Also visiting was Florence Mary Parsley, a dressmaker aged 20, who had been born in 1870 above her father's shop to John and Emma Parsley. She had elder siblings John, Annie and Bill, and later a brother Jim. Florence was sensitive and a little neurotic. Her father, John, a bootmaker, was evidently a rather frightening man, and on one occasion when he came home, the young Florence had jumped from a second-story window to avoid him, injuring herself. Henry and Florence were married in 1891 at Exeter, Devon. Henry was ordained in 1893 and took up a post as chaplain of St. John's Horsley Down in Surrey and then St. Stephen's in Battersea. By 1901, Henry Chatham Rowe had been appointed a chaplain and naval instructor in the Royal Navy. Florence was not very socially inclined and found it hard to fit the pattern of Navy chaplain's wife. Henry was a man's man and his wife did not receive much of his attention. At the time of the census in 1901, Henry was aboard the HMS Royal Sovereign in the Grand Harbour, Malta, and he was serving on the HMS Prince George when, on the 11th of May 1902, Henry and Florence's son, Reginald Tigloth Rowe, known as Reggie, was born. His unusual second name was a reference to Tigloth Parza III, a prominent king of Assyria in the 8th century BC, who commanded the greatest fighting force in the world. He features in Byron's poem, The Destruction of Sennacherib, The Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold. In 1904, Henry transferred to the HMS Majestic, then the HMS Emerald, and on the 26th of January, their daughter Kathleen Mary Rowe was born. Her birth registered at Queenstown Cork in Ireland, perhaps where her father's ship was docked. Later in 1906, Henry took up his post on the HMS Vengeance and then the HMS Excellent. By 1911, the family's home address was a house named Glenheim in London Road, Waterlooville, Hampshire. Three years later, Henry left the Navy and in 1914 took the living as a rector of Bellingham, Northumberland, moving his family into the rectory. Here, he preached hellfire and brimstone sermons to his small elderly congregation, embarrassing his wife and daughter, once predicting Armageddon the end of the world next Thursday, and exhorting his parishioners to cleanse themselves of sin before it was too late, only to be obliged to make a face-saving follow-up speech the next week. Kitty played the organ at the church and was terribly embarrassed. After leaving Northumberland, Henry took up a post as navigation instructor at the Nautical College in Pangbourne. By the age of 19, young Reggie, described by his sister as a very naughty boy, was in serious trouble. A home for fallen women contacted his parents to tell them that Reggie had got a farmer's daughter pregnant. His father Henry was by then an assistant master at the Royal Masonic School, and being a straight, laced clergyman, insisted on the marriage, and was himself a witness at the ceremony. Reggie married Alice Cripps, then aged 21, on the 21st of January 1922. Their son Eric, Tiggy, was born later that year. After serving as a pilot in Canada during the war, Tiggy eventually worked for the BBC, was friendly with Orson Welles, and was introduced by Noel Coward at a party. Here's Tiggy, he's queer, he likes girls. Henry Chatham Rowe's own marriage was occasionally stormy, as he was not a natural family man, and his wife and daughter wanted more of his attention. 
On one occasion, in a disagreement with his wife Florence, Henry threw a whole plated Sunday roast out of the window. Later, when money was short, Florence somewhat resented her husband spending money on cricket bats for the local boys of Hertfordshire to practice with. Henry Chatham Rowe retired in 1940, and his address was given as 27 Melbourne Road, Bushy, Hertfordshire, when he died on the 23rd of December 1926. He left £410, 19 shillings, and 9 dimes. Florence Mary Rowe was found a place in a home for retired ladies by her daughter-in-law, Alice, and died in 1948. Ralph Henry Pattinson was born in 1859 in Nolsey, Lancashire. In 1881, aged 22, he was described in the census as unemployed, living in Nolsey with his father John, who was 64, his mother Martha Eliza, 59, and the sibling John, 16. Sarah Hewitt was born in 1862 or 63, also in Nolsey, Lancashire, and at the time of the census in 1881 she was aged 19 living in Nolsey with her father Joseph, 47, mother Mary, 40, and a large family of brothers and sisters. Ralph and Sarah Pattinson married and also had many children. Their 13th child, coming after many girls, was Hector Stanley Pattinson, born on the 14th of March in 1903. Hector Stanley Pattinson, known later as Pat, was living at the time of the 1911 census at 269 Marsh Lane, Bootle, Liverpool, aged 8, with his father Ralph Henry Pattinson, aged 52, and mother Sarah Pattinson. The couple had been married for 30 years. The census information states that they had 10 children alive and one who had died, although family law holds that Hector was the 13th child. Ralph was a joiner who at the time worked for an undertaker. In 1911, four of Hector's sisters were living at home, three of which were employed as laundresses. Hector was the only surviving son of the family, and they had high hopes for him. Despite being born into a working-class background, he was sent at great expense to Mill Hill Public School, where the fees were paid by one of his sisters. His social status was therefore enhanced, and he was able to make connections in the affluent bushy set in Hertfordshire. It came as a terrific shock to him when he was called into the headmaster's study at the age of 16 and told he must leave Mill Hill as his sister was no longer able to pay the fees. After struggling for a short while to support himself, he decided to try his luck in Canada, where he found employment as a labourer on the expanding Pacific Railway. His sister Maud was living in British Columbia, Canada in 1921. Story goes that whilst in Canada, he was once so drunk that he fell off his bicycle and knocked out all his front teeth. Hector returned to Southampton from Montreal, aged 21, on the 9th of October 1924, on the RMS Empress of France. He renewed his acquaintance in Hertfordshire, where by 1926, aged 23, he had met Kathleen Rowe, who had become quite keen on him, and her parents Henry and Florence. Blessed with good looks, Hector was also able to attract the attention of an eccentric homosexual sponsor, who was so struck with him that he declared Hector to be the incarnation of Jesus Christ himself. However, a living still had to be earned, and the young Hector, always a restless person, then ventured alone to Australia, where he began a happy affair with Aunt Molly, a lady perhaps in her early 40s. The intrepid Kathleen Rowe also travelled to Australia with Evelyn and met up with Hector again later in New South Wales, where they were married in 1930. As a married woman, Kathleen had to give up her employment with the ABC, and a pressing need for money found Hector offering rotten pineapples for sale on street corners, where he passed them off as desirable fruits by carefully showing only the good side to his customers. Hector and Kitty paid a visit back to England, arriving in Southampton on the 14th of June 1930, on the SS Jarvis Bay. Hector and Kathleen's daughter Elizabeth Wyville Pattinson was born in London on the 2nd of February 1932. Hector then accepted Aunt Molly's offer to bring his family to live with her and run her peaches and cream farm in New Zealand. He sailed from Liverpool on the 10th of September 1933, aged 30, described as a surveyor, with Kitty aged 27 and Elizabeth aged 1. He set up a bartering arrangement with a farmer from the neighbouring vineyard, swapping his piles of cow manure for wine. Subject to spasmodic doubts of unbelievable bad temper, Hector occasionally escaped from the farm by disappearing off to the races, and at least one occasion leaving his cows unmilked. Always somewhat eccentric, he put his expensively educated accent and manner to good use when, having knocked a policeman's helmet off while drunk, he escaped arrest by claiming to be a good friend of New Zealand's head of police. Eventually, it was clear that the cost of getting the farm produce to market exceeded the value, and the peaches and cream venture proved unprofitable. Hector was forced to sell the stock, his favourite cow mooing sadly at him as she departed. 
on the 10th of June 1934, their second child, Henry Chatham Pattinson, also known as Toby, was born, and Hector now ended his long relationship with Aunt Molly and set off back to England with his family, arriving in London on the 30th of October 1934. They found that there was no employment and answered an ad for a family to run a chicken farm in the West Country. They had to kill and pluck chickens as well as feed them. During this process, Pat hung Toby upside down by the legs and suggested he be killed, a cause of much laughter. Next door lived Miss Lear, whose brother owned Priory Ditchies. When Pat and Kitty met, she announced that she was Miss, but no virgin, thank God. When they later asked her to become Henry's godmother, she said, What you mean is will I leave him some money? The answer is yes. Miss Lear, Henry's godmother, left him a bungalow in Ditchies. But as he was a minor, it had to be sold, and the proceeds put into government 3.5% bonds. When he came of age in 1955, much of the value of the house had disappeared, and Henry got very little, but used it to good purpose, realised about £200, or £5,200 in today's money. Miss Lear took an interest in both children. They stayed with her in the Priory Ditchy, her brother's home, and helped her with goats which were, in effect, her children. She was a lifelong friend. Whilst Kathleen learnt to play the accordion in Edgware Park, Hector tried his hand at insurance. He could not bow and scrape, so he failed. Right, but he could not take orders. In desperation, he found work as a bus conductor for London Transport, eventually becoming an inspector. He followed the cricket, going to Lords and the Oval, and applied himself to betting on the horses, having an account with a bookmaker, and travelling to the races. Either racing or cricket was always showing on the television. He enjoyed whiskey and cigarettes, suffering later from emphysema. Although highly intelligent, with a marked mathematical ability, Hector was not adaptable as a subordinate, and disliked taking instruction from his employers. He had been handsome and spoilt when young, being the precious son after all those daughters, and could be bad-tempered. Nonetheless, Hector had a kind nature, liked to take his children to the dog track and the cinema, and willingly gave up his drinking to save money to pay Henry's fees at Westminster, so that his son could have the advantages he himself had missed. Hector was also subject to irrational temper, but he was never violent. In later life, he mellowed and became quite a good painter. He also got on well with the children. Now we move to the life of Kathleen Mary Rowe. As a little girl of five in Hampshire, Kathleen was already able to play the piano for her parents to dance, and by the age of nine or ten, living in the rectory at Bellingham in Northumberland, she was playing the church organ at services. She was sent to boarding school in Scotland during the Great War. At twelve, she applied to the Royal Academy of Music in London, but her entry was deliberately delayed because of her youth. She then won the Tholberg Scholarship to study at the Academy. By the time she left the Academy, she was a sub-professor of pianoforte and had won several medals for pianoforte, singing and harmony, and the London Festival Composition Prize. Kitty was the only holder of a certificate of merit in accompaniment and was in demand as an accompanist for the licentiate of the Royal Academy of Music Examinations. Kitty must have become acquainted with the handsome Hector Pattinson by 1926 when her parents were living at 27 Melbourne Road, Bushy in Hertfordshire. After leaving the Royal Academy at the age of 22, she sailed for Australia with her friend Evelyn, partly in pursuit of Hector, who had gone there to seek his fortune. The long voyage took 12 weeks after leaving Southampton on the 3rd of February 1928. After her arrival in 1928, Kitty went to the Australian Broadcasting Company looking for work and convinced them that her Royal Academy of Music sub-professorship and her connection to Sir Henry Wood, she was the person they should take on and that they would be lucky to get her. Her charm won her the job and they employed her as the pianist and accompanist of the radio, where she also worked on the children's programme as Auntie Kitty. During her time in Australia, Kitty met a man who owned a vast farm the size of Wales but decided against marrying him as life on the station in the outback did not appeal to her in the least. The men were out all day, leaving the women at home, where Kitty was bitten by terrible fleas living under the house. She decided that she could not live in such conditions with his extended family of dull Australian aunts. Kitty met up with Hector Pattinson again in New South Wales, and they were married there in 1930. 
They had little money and struggled to pay the wedding fee, so the priest waived the charges as a wedding present to the couple. Jobs during the Depression were like gold dust, and Kitty was unfortunately fired from her post at the ABC on the pretext that she was now a married woman, that her place should be taken by a man. They travelled back on a visit to England, and on the 14th of June, 1930, Hector, aged 27, and Kathleen, aged 23, arrived in Southampton from Brisbane on the SS Jarvis Bay. They stayed at 41 Buckingham Road, Edgware, with one of Hector's sisters who lived in a good semi-detached council house. While in New Zealand, Kitty began a lifelong platonic friendship with Philip W. Robertson, a socialist who was head of chemistry at Wellington University, later Professor Emeritus. He had attended Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar, gaining a first-class honours at Trinity College, but considered the chemistry teaching abysmal. He moved to Germany and gained his PhD from Leipzig, afterwards teaching in Burma and lecturing at the Imperial College in London. Philip had a deep interest in literature and writing, knew and loved the Aeneid in the original Latin and admired the Victorian writer. He was very much in love with Kitty and presented her with copies of two of his philosophical literary works, A Soul's Progress and Life and Beauty, dedicated for Kathleen in memory of her beautiful music. He also appreciated Japanese poetry and sent her verses in the hockey style. Philip eventually separated from his wife and after retiring from the university settled in London. He and Kitty used to travel abroad together in Europe, visiting Bruges and Venice. When he died, he left money in the trust to Kitty. After the birth, in 1934, of Hector and Kitty's son, Henry Chatham Pattinson, they returned to England from Auckland on the SS Rangitata on the 30th of October, 1934. Here, Hector found employment on a chicken farm in Ditchie, Dorset, where Miss Lear, a member of the farm owner's family, lived with her brother at the Priory. They then lived for a while with Hector's sister in Edgware. Kitty was welcomed back by Sir Henry Wood, but was out of practice and could not re-establish herself as a professional pianist. Hector tried to be an insurance salesman but failed. Kitty wanted to pull the family out of the hole and the accordion was a popular instrument which was also portable so Kitty put aside her dislike of popular music and learned to play the accordion. As they were still living at the time with Hector's sister she had to go out to the local park to practice as the noise was too much for the other people in the house. She had to put up with the grinning comments of the kids in the park. Later in her career she suffered a cerebral hemorrhage as a result of her carrying the heavy accordion. Kitty joined a theatre group where she played for the performances. When she went on tour, Henry and Elizabeth were sent north to one of Hector's sisters on the east coast. At this time, Henry became dangerously ill with breathing difficulties and Kitty had to make the choice between earning money and leaving the tour to take care of her son. The entrepreneur who was promoting the tour had no sympathy for her predicament and disliked her crying whilst playing. Tell that bitch to get fired, he said to the actors. Not being able to face her himself, Kitty steeled herself to continue with work and went on playing and kept her job. Hector's family had considered sending a telegram to ask her to come to the child, but decided it was too expensive or he might not die after all. During the war, Kitty joined the ENSA and worked continually, appearing with Max Miller among others in the music halls and nightclubs of London, where the little semi-nude girls would be entertaining the customers. Kitty would appear in contrast at the end of the evening in a sequined evening dress, singing sentimental songs such as Ave Maria and Home Sweet Home, and the inebriated clientele would push five pound notes at her. At the Theatre Royal in Drury Lane, one night she was singing beautiful Italian songs to the accompaniment of her accordion when she unexpectedly got booed off the stage, unaware that Italy had just declared war on Great Britain. As a parson's daughter, she became concerned for the welfare of the girls, sometimes as young 15-year-olds who were working as entertainers. She wondered if she should warn them against the seedy men they encountered, but this wartime and moral standards were lax. Kitty realised her concern was irrelevant when one of the girls she was so worried about looked in the mirror to powder her nose and declared, Oh God, I'm pregnant again. Coming home for once from an ENSA engagement, she noticed a padre in the back of the bus with one of the women, who shouted to the rest, Remember, he's only human. Later she played the piano in the film The Upturned Glass. Pat's temper and Kitty touring the country working in the made them drift apart. After the war, the children were brought back to London and Kitty decided to keep the family together despite Pat continuing with his mistress Isla. Kitty's career flourished and by the end of the war, under the stage name Gay Patrick, she was
was earning £2,000 a year, about 10 times as much as a graduate could hope to earn at her time. Her determination kept the family going. She and Hector were both convinced of the importance of a good education for the children, and Hector particularly wanted to re-establish his son's social position, despite his own previous difficulties, and so they both made sacrifices to send Henry to Westminster. Kitty was expecting a third child when, sadly, she contracted meningitis and lost the baby. After the war, Kitty and Hector rented a flat in the first floor of a Georgian house in 14 Cambridge Gardens, Kilburn. As a consequence of people fleeing from London or being bombed out, they were able to decorate it with beautiful antique furniture, large mirrors and chandeliers, and magnificent red silk curtains, all purchased at auction sales. Kathleen continued as an entertainer and played for the soundtrack of some films, where she came to know Alec Guinness and Alistair Sim. For the soundtrack of The Upturned Glass with James Mason, Kitty played Debussy, which Mason and admired, but the director decided not to use it in the final cut. As the musicals declined, she played in the restaurants and pubs and seaside concerts in the summer. She played until the mid-60s, chasing the nimble guinea, as she put it. She played for a local school dance class and made several classical piano recordings before her arthritis made her frustrated and dissatisfied with her execution. Kathleen Mary Pattinson died on the 12th of July, 1976. Elizabeth Wyville Pattinson, known as Liz, was born on the 2nd of February 1932. Her unusual second name of Wyville was given because her mother thought she might one day want to disassociate herself from her bad-tempered father, and that a romantic, distinguished name might be useful to her. While living at Hendon in a dilapidated, condemned house, she was aged about five and she was looking after her brother Henry, aged three, while Hector and Kitty were out at work. The family were short of money, and Liz, who was very concerned about this, used to steal from Woolworths with Henry, on one frightening occasion getting caught at the shop and locked in a room for a long period. She also got hold of some flowers and sat outside Woolworths trying to sell them to passers-by. In 1939, at the beginning of the war, many homes were left empty by their owners, and resourceful Liz with her little brother Henry used to rush around the houses looking for anything useful. Hector had obtained a magnificent radiogram to play music for dancing and the top of this, covered with felt, was used as an ironing board, with an iron heated on the gas stove. After doing the ironing, about age seven, Liz and Henry went out, leaving the iron to burn through the polished top. They were terrified of their father's temper, and Liz tried desperately to remove the burn mark with polish, but it was a hopeless effort. Kitty had an engagement at one time as a pianist in a theatre in Reading, and the family stayed for a while in the little hotel. It was uncertain what should be done with children at the outbreak of the war, and Hector's friend Isla took fancy to Liz, not Henry, who describes himself as a sour but little boy, and had half an idea of taking over the maternal role from Kitty, who was often obliged to be away working. It was eventually decided that Liz should go away to Inverness where Isla's husband, Bertie Chewett, had a house on a lot and be looked after by the housekeeper there. She travelled on a train from London by herself, aged seven. Meanwhile, Henry was taken on by the wife of the doorman of the Reading Theatre, Miss Thatcher. Liz was lonely in Inverness, and after her changeable life experiences so far, found it difficult to trust adults. When she returned to Reading, she did not make a favourable impression on Miss Thatcher. She danced a silent pirouette for her, perhaps meaning to show what a quiet, good girl she could be. Henry and Liz remained with the Thatcher family for much of the war, for the first time being looked after in a stable, well-managed family environment, able to ride their bicycles in the farmlands on the edge of town. Mr Thatcher was depressive, but his wife was very good with children, having a boy, Peter, of their own, and an adopted girl as well as evacuees. Liz gained a scholarship to a private school in Reading, being bright and capable. Back in London at the end of the war, Liz went to a grammar school in North London, making lifelong friends among the girls, her best friend Sally Ritchie becoming a nurse. Liz was accepted for a place in Bedford College at London University to study mathematics, but after two years became pregnant and was forced to leave without finishing her degree. She then married Michael Arthur Theman, known as Mike, who was a medical student at University College London in 1952. Their daughter, Susan Mary Theman, was born on the 8th of August 1952, and they had a small flat in Hampstead, which Pat found for them when they had Susan. They later moved to a basement flat in Earl's Court. Their son, Colin Graham Theman was born on the 17th of December 1954. It was a hard time as junior doctors were badly paid and Mike was often living away at the hospital and Liz was on her own with two young children and little money. Mike signed up for the army at 
for the last part of his medical training as they were offering a cash incentive. He was stationed at Aldershot and the family lived in an army house in Frimley in Surrey. His first posting was to the military hospital in Accra in Ghana where Liz very much liked the social life in the army as they were now able to enjoy Mike's good salary and the freedom and excitement of living abroad. She worked for a firm of architects for a while and then Charles Michael Thiemann was born on the 24th of March 1960. The family returned to England for a couple of years and then went to Germany. Susan and Colin were placed in boarding schools in England at the ages of 10 and 8 as the schools for the forces in Germany were not too good. Liz was unable to find a job in Germany but learned the language and started a playgroup for her son Charles and his friends. Boarding when the family moved to Hong Kong and finished her education at the army school there. Charles joined his brother at Eastbourne College when he was 10. Again, Liz was unable to work because for most employment it was necessary to be by and she did not speak Cantonese well enough. She learned shorthand and typing and Chinese cookery from Ah Li, the armour, in exchange for teaching her sewing. The boys left boarding school and the family were all together again when Mike was finally stationed in Colchester, Essex. They moved to Wivenhoe. Liz finished her maths degree at Cambridge and trained as a teacher, obtaining a job tutoring sixth form at the girls' high school. Liz and Mike were divorced in 1977 and Liz lived for a time in Spain with her second husband. Following his death she found a happy life with Archie, returning to Wivenhoe, where she lived until her death from pancreatic cancer at the age of 72. Henry Chatham Pattinson was born on the 10th of June 1934. Henry's parents saw a film starring Charles Lawton as Sir Toby Belch. As Henry was always belching, they gave him that nickname. When the family was living in Hendon, they had a fox terrier dog called Sammy, who would sit on the end of the children's beds and bite anyone who came near, including on one occasion his father Hector. Henry and Elizabeth were often left to their own devices in their childhood, as their mother Kitty had to work constantly to earn the family keep. Once, when punting on the river, Henry pushed Elizabeth off the boat, where she nearly drowned. When they got back to the shore, Henry ran away and locked himself in the lavatory, refusing to come out unless his father promised not to punish him. Henry has vivid memories of visiting his grandmother, eating her delicious treacle tart and being taken to the barbers. During the war, the children lived with Mr and Mrs Thatcher in 73 Baker Street, Reading. During 1935 to 1945, they were rarely visited by their parents, Kitty coming down twice and Pat only once. On that visit, Pat was with his girlfriend Isla and insisted authoritatively that Mrs Thatcher fetch the children out of school to see him. Mrs Thatcher considered the Pattinsons as rather eccentric. Henry attended Presentation College, a Catholic day school in Reading, where the brothers who ran it were very rigid. Boys hardly dared to ask to visit the loo, and on one occasion Henry was so terrified that he pissed all over the floor. Later he went to Arnold House. Among his contemporaries were Jonathan Miller and John Bingham, later Lord Lucan. Bingham was known for playing vicious tricks and invited Miller to Lord's Cricket Ground, where he strolled in himself, laughing at Miller who was stuck on the other side of the turnstile without a ticket. Miller became a well-known opera producer. Bingham, later Lord Lucan, was famous for gambling and murder. The third very bright boy known as Gurley Cowman became a distinguished fine art publisher, murdered by a hitchhiker. Returning to London, Henry was taken to see the great impresario Donald Walford performing Shakespeare and was introduced to Tchaikovsky and Hayden from Gramophone Records. Henry attended Westminster School and for national service joined the Air Force. He underwent competitive training as an officer cadet and was selected to be personal assistant to Air Vice Marshal Merton. During his interview, Henry had to leave the room when Sir Winston Churchill rang up the Air Vice Marshal, who was ordered by Churchill to take command of RAF New Zealand. So, Henry was then appointed as a personnel officer, RAF Pembury, monitoring the activities of 300 men, after which he was promoted to the position of adjutant at RAF Anstruther, overseeing administration and often directing officers twice his age. He was encouraged to take a permanent commission, but he was blind to the opportunities that such a commission would offer in the long run, so completing his national service, he read English at Keble College, Oxford. Then he joined Monsanto Chemicals as science was thought to offer a bright future. After training in heavy chemicals, he turned to plastics and eventually controlled the sales of large volume plastic 
raw materials. He then switched to Grindig, where he reorganised the sale of their record machines. He switched to BASF to become Director of Audio and Video. Sales compounded at an average rate of 30-70% to 70 from a low base for 10 years. This luck was followed by being put in charge of the external affairs just when the demand for tape recording declined. He developed contacts with the chemical world, became London Chairman of the Society of the Chemical Industry and took up political PR, promoting sensible legislation in the EU. He worked with the Berlin Cancer Institute and many others. Henry retired at age 62 and formed his own PR company, working in Brussels and London, retiring formally at age 66. Inga Bookwrights and Henry Pattinson met in 1962 when Henry's friends hired a splendid house in Highgate and lent out rooms. Inga was born in Silkeborg, Denmark, to Hans and Helga Bookwrights, who married in 1934. Who are Kielke? That's where my mum and dad were married. In 34, Gamble Dad's school is where my mother was born and uh, where she lived all her life and she became a teacher. Helga was born in her father's farm, Gamal Dustrup Gord, near Kellerup. It was a major farm with fine equipment and splendid horses. Rich though they were, the nine children had to work hard on the farm. For example, in the bitter winter they would have to pick potatoes. Her parents were ambitious for the children who prospered. For example, the eldest boy became a doctor and Helga became a school teacher. Uh, then we have Inge Mølle, got some connection with the family. I'm not quite sure. They're all buried there, I think. Epstrup Skogård is where my mum and dad, they owned that Epstrup Skogård. Uh, but uh, my father's cows all died of tuberculosis, and therefore he started cutting down the trees around and from then on and then on he became the most wealthy person in Singapore. And there's my mother feeding the chickens. That is the centre of Singapore. In fact, I think, can we still see it somewhere? It's a statue. And Hinge Valla, I'm not quite sure about this Hinge something to do with the ancestors of the war. That's my father shooting. And that dog is called Sifu. He's shooting animals. Now he starts his factory there in Hans Buchheis. And they are doing all the wood and all the what have you people all the countryside and life around there. That is my fight, that is me, and that is Carl. And that is Singapore. You all know that place, don't you? Yeah. And that's what the summer house looked like. And which is now demolished because it was made out of asbestos. And, and that boy? is Carl Fish. Hans was also born in a farm, Estrup Gore, near Kellerup. He took over his father's farm and tried to make a go of it. However, his cows died from tuberculosis and he tried to make money by selling peat and by collecting the milk from local farms and selling it to the co-op. Then he started cutting his trees to make telephone poles to meet rising demand for the foam then followed his building factory to treat trees for use in harbours. He opened his factory in 1937. Eventually, Hans had an additional factory for making doors for German blocks of flats, which were in demand because of Allied bombing. He topped that with a factory making kitchen furniture materials. Inga's parents had a great love of life. They bought a summer house in Saxil Ola in 1947, and they used it every summer. Later, Inga and Henry stayed every summer as children grow up and had fun with the extended family. Later, for several years, they entertained the whole extended family in Skien, installing the family all in summer houses and treating them to drinks in the harbour and dinner in the evening. Inga was always adventurous and persuaded her parents to pay for terms in German and English boarding schools as part of her education. After graduating in business studies in Aarhus, she then worked for a German bank in Switzerland. She had been much influenced by an Anglophile teacher who thought much of Oxford, so after Switzerland, her sister's husband, Jess Alberskull, got her a job of secretary to Donald Stokes, director of British Leyland, a major company in those days. So she took the job and stayed at the Danish YWCA. She then 
Ben shared a room with a girlfriend, Pilla, in the Highgate house. At a party, she asked if there was anyone there with an Oxford accent. Thus, she found Henry. They were married in Kellerup Church and celebrated in Hotel Dana. After the wedding, their taxi took them to a hunting hotel. It was closed. Henry climbed through the window, struck matches and was surrounded by spooky animal heads. He had to find a room and pushed a door propelling a man's bed forward at speed. He had to beat the retreat quickly. They set up home in 6 Grange Avenue and Tom was born in February 1965. Henry left Monsanto and they, they bought a Triumph Herald convertible. Marina was born in December 1966 and Annette in 1968 when they moved to 14 Oak Way in Shortlands. In 1989, Henry and Inga bought number 2 Edward Road, a five bedroom locally listed detached house built in 1903, during which time Inga was running Julian Dancewear with shops in Beckenham and Shirley with a large staff and brilliant results. During 1970 to 2000, the family had holidays in the summer house and in ski resorts, whilst Henry and Inga were often at plays, concerts and outings in Glyndebourne with friends and business, politics and music. Tom was born in February 1965. He attended King's School in Canterbury before studying political science and government at UCL. Tom had a long and illustrious career as a salesman selling IT and security services. Marina was born in 1966 and went to Sydenham High School. She read Combined Sciences at the University of Leicester, attaining a bachelor's degree before working in the Conservative Central Office as a secretary and then as a PR assistant for GCI Sterling. Annette was born in 1968 and also attended Sydenham High School. Annette read law at the University of Hull and worked as a conveyancer for Barnes. Both Annette and Marina took over Julian Dancewear from Inga in around 2008. Tom and Claire Godfrey had a son Richard and married in 1995 in Bromley. Robert was born in 1997 and later Amy in 2002. Marina and Peter Hollis got married in 1994 at the Danish Church in London. Anna was born in 1995 and Emma was born in 1998. Annette and Andrew Raby got married in 1995. Michael was born in 1998, Louisa in 1999 and Catherine, also known as Snudge, in 2003. In 2008, Henry and Inga treated the family to a holiday in Kenya and Tanzania. We flew to Nairobi, then had our own plane to the Highlands where we stayed in tents and had excursions to the Masai Mara, seeing the massive herds of antelopes cross the river full of crocodiles and many wild animals. The warriors taught the children how to make arrows. After a week, we flew to Zanzibar, saw a slave market and sailed to a magic isle which disappeared under the water once we had finished diving amongst the fish. In 2014, the family visited Costa Rica where we saw volcanoes and coffee plantations, explored canals in search of caimans, ziplined through the jungle and even snorkeled. The holiday ended with the most magnificent lobster party on New Year's Eve. In 2018, Henry and Inga took the family to South Africa. We all loved the Thorny Bush private game reserve, luxury rooms, food and endless drinks, plus the most game we have ever seen, even on TV. We then enjoyed Cape Town and finally Friendship Valley, where we stayed in the stunning La Fontaine guest house. We have all experienced such a wonderful family life, with the grandchildren growing up together as cousins and close friends, and enjoying seeing Henry and Inga every weekend as children and very often as adults. And this is how our family came to be. Where we are today and where we've come from. The end.